Hey everybody and welcome to a special 10-4. Um, we've got something a little more unique this time. We're going to do something a little bit different. We've got people, somebody from each of the disciplines to kind of do the round table. We're going to go through a lot of the questions that we've got from the forums and uh, talk a little bit about how that impacts each of our jobs. Uh, but first we want to thank the subscribers uh, because without you guys we couldn't do this. Right? Our subscribers kick us a little bit every month to allow us to do this enhanced community content that uh, we hope you're uh, going to enjoy. So I kind of want to go real quick around and introduce who I'm sitting with uh, to my right. Adam Weezer, associate writer here at uh, Sig LA. Awesome. And I'm Eric Kyron Davis. I'm senior producer here at Sig LA. Calix Renault, tech designer. Uh, Forrest Stefan, uh, CG supervisor. And we are super excited to go through these questions. You guys kicked us a lot of really good ones. Um, and so we're just going to start off if you guys are ready. You guys ready? Dig in. Let's, Let's do go. this. Okay. All right. First up from uh, Zeshio. I think it's Zeshio. That's what we're going to go with. It's a great name. Uh, who generally starts the idea process for a ship, a planet, etc.? Are the writers the ones who start the lore first, or do they just fill in the details if an artist comes up with a really good ship idea from scratch? Do you follow a specific guidance from CR, or are you allowed to submit ideas through a creative development process that gets vetted through each of the game features? So who wants to start off with this? Where do, where do ideas come from? I'm going to start there. Yeah. Well, we'll start over yeah. here. Uh, <clears throat> there's definitely, you know, um, when it comes to planets, uh, a lot of the star map stuff definitely did originate with, uh, with the lore team. Um, uh, when it comes to ships, other, other elements like that, there definitely are ideas that we have that we definitely, you know, have vetted through Chris that are going to be implemented in the game, and maybe we do take a lore first perspective on it that then trickles down to the other departments. Yeah. But there have been plenty of... Uh, plenty of moments that you guys have come into our office too and said, hey, we're working on this really cool thing. How can you help us kind of build the world around it? Or how can we, you know, justify it in the lore to a certain degree? So um, it definitely it definitely works both ways dependent on on what it is and yeah. uh, what, what's needed to get done. Yeah, well, I've seen a lot too, even from the art side, is that you do get that enhanced back and forth, right? You may have this great script that you guys have written, but then it just doesn't work, right, artistically. And so these guys come in and and it, it imply like, hey, would this still work within that world? And it's this cool back and forth. I think it, I think there I think the, the point of this question is there's no one starting point, right? There's a yeah. there's a many different avenues that we follow, and, and it's um it's I don't know I think it's really exciting. It's really cool. Everybody gets involved. All right, moving on. Next question <clears throat> um, from Chaplain. Uh, from a team perspective, producers, writers, artists, and designers, how have the ship pipeline and development slash balancing process changed since the original ship packages were on sale? Did those change, if any, uh, did those changes, if any, change how ships and the lore of involving those ships have been developed since then to account for balancing those ships with other ships that have been introduced after the first batch? So the question is, from the beginning, right, from the beginning of making ships, from the beginning of the idea of what Star Citizen would become, has, has that process changed, right? Now, right? Do we do things differently developing ships, maybe from the lore side? And, and maybe there's only a few people in here that can speak to the, the original, but I think at the same time, you know, how, how has it changed or has it changed, right? For the better, or kind of how's it gone? I think on the lore side, it's quite similar, only we have, you know, more writers, obviously, yeah. and we get yeah. better fleshed out ideas earlier on. We have yeah. more designers, so we get better designs earlier on. Um, previously, you know, obviously we started. Um, with you know running pre-production production at the same time you know and we started from scratch with no company right and yeah. Uh, yeah. this ships we had to build these pipelines for how these ships work as we were building the ships themselves um, which explains a lot of the reasons that we you know we go back to the Connie and we're like all right now that we got to figure it out let's you know let's, right. let's revamp it a yeah. little bit and do it right and yeah. then um, you know probably initially we've seen that you know a lot of things you know is it compatible you know the original constellation is a perfect example you know we kind of got the ship going we wanted to get it out there but it's like okay wait a minute how does that actually the um, uh, the the escape pods actually come out of the ship yeah. um, when you lower the uh, elevator, wait a minute, do I really want only one person to be able to get into the ship at a time? Maybe I want three, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so these are things that was just part of the evolution process. And pipelines in general, uh, you know, you get it going, you get it started, and then you have to use it a couple times, and then you figure out what works, what doesn't work, and then it continually evolves. And I think with design as well. And one thing that we absolutely learned is how important it is to get design and uh, the literature as early as possible and as much fleshed out as possible yeah. because uh, it significantly helps and it significantly saves time. And spending that time in the beginning uh, saves a lot of time at the end. To, to speak to, you know, because I'm at six months, I think, so right, I haven't been here since the original, but like even what, what I was really excited about with, let's say, just the Endeavor, the most recent one, I, I felt like, and I know we've done this with a lot of ships recently, that was the first time I saw everyone that needed to get involved got involved really early. 
All right, we're doing that actually right now on a couple other ships. But I was really excited because I got to sit in those meetings that we had everybody involved, Tony and Ben and all the, all the key stakeholders from the beginning. It wasn't like, hey, we got this far down this ship concept and we never showed Bill over there, all right? We never showed this guy. We never even showed the writers. It was kind of cool to see that one kind of come together. And, and all the ones we're starting to do now, it's got this level of polish from the beginning. So when we're getting into these phases and we start developing that ship, it's like, yeah. And the goal is to get it in. We've learned uh, the most important thing is to get it in the game as soon as possible. That's cool. Even if it's just shapes. Get it flying, get it moving, see what works, see what doesn't work, and not try to build an entire ship from scratch yeah. and then get it in the game, but build the ship uh, very simple, what we call a white box, which is more like proxy based, mm -hmm. and then get it in where it's functional for design to start balance and testing. And then they could already be balanced and testing what we're actually doing the final art, and then we're just swapping things out right mm -hmm. as we go. And then we start with the white box phase, which is again just the proxies, and then we move on to the gray box phase, uh, which is like the constellation during the uh, uh, our previous uh, Gamescom demo. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like the ship is there, you see it, it's not final, but it's pretty close and you can visualize what it will look like, and then obviously we do our final pass, which is our yeah. um, pristine, pristine version. Yeah, that's, I mean, context is everything in, mm -hmm. in making these artistic decisions of like how this thing should feel, how this thing should behave, what it should look like. Uh, and so we have, we've gained all this experience from creating Arena Commander, creating all these ships that are, are flyable, and, and the uh, combat and the flight behaviors and all of that. We can, we can see what the game is like, just load it up and play it. Uh, and so that's the same thing that that informs our decisions, that informs how we want to make the thing grow. And to your point of like getting it in as early as possible, we need to see what it is in order to see what we want it to be. Yeah, yeah. that totally. helps. <laughs> I when I started, yeah. we barely had a game. You know, you yeah. could barely, I mean, you could yeah. fly around. I mean, the, Chris, the, the first demo I ever saw was uh, Chris showing me the Hornet on a landing pad, and you mm. could kind of fly it around. But yeah. now, uh, but we didn't have all these game modes back then, you yeah. know what I mean? So now we can actually, we have all these game modes, so we can throw these ships in a very early stage and see how it, how does this ship handle gets a swarm of, uh, you know, Vandal ships, right, mm -hmm. uh, of Scythe's. Or in a glaive, right? And the, so yeah, and the ship pipeline has gone through a lot of changes, but I almost feel like that's just very natural, right? Like it's very natural. What you what you had from the beginning, like right now, if we made uh, an RSI ship, we might be able to steal pieces from previous ships. You didn't have that when you first started yeah. Pipeline. You're making everything from scratch, right? It's right. like doing sequels of movies and stuff. Like, Iteration. I already got you. Exactly. It's about right. evolving it yeah. and not you know, doing things from scratch. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. times it seems like we're doing things from scratch, but really we're, we're not evolving totally. it. Totally. Yeah, and, and from the lore perspective, too, a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about, like they've, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting before this, like Dave and Will, and, and obviously with Chris and Ben involved in that, too, is kind of like setting those guidelines, putting the ideas or just kind of like our thoughts into the corporation matrix or in certain places. So designers, artists, can go in and look and see exactly what's uh, you know what the intention behind all those is too, and then kind of forms the designs to it. So uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. All right. So the next question, I'm actually going to merge two questions that we've had um, recently. So the first one is from Monster. Ask the question: Will the Star Map be available on the App Store for iPhone or iPads? And then I'm going to merge that with the other person that had a Star Map question, which was Elmac. Elmac asked. Will we be able to download an offline version of the Star Map to our devices to, uh, for those times that we either don't have internet connection or we don't want to use our mobile data? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, you. yeah, uh, regarding the Star Map, uh, we just had, we did a Q&A this week, which everyone should go and uh, check on the uh, RSI main site. That'll explain a lot of that. We are looking into the ability to have um, to have it, you know, a tablet, to like a, you know, kind of Android app for it. Not quite yet, but that's definitely something that we realize people want and would be a pretty cool thing to do. The offline mode, I'm not sure exactly where we are. That that does seem like a function that would be useful, um, but the technical behind that is is definitely going to be a turbulent thing, less of a, a lore kind of team thing. But uh, glad everyone loves it, and uh, yeah, it's that's yeah, awesome. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of fun to run around in. Yeah, I just want to do that all day. That's all I want to do. He's doing it right. I'm now. doing it right now. Actually, <laughs> I just Stop planned it. my. Next Next jump point, no. Um, all right, cool. The next question uh, we got from Buzzkiller. Buzzkiller asks, in the monthly report, there was talk of a restructure underway to bring the various disciplines together in a more cohesive team. I'm guessing this is also to take full advantage of the increased space in the new LA office building. How much of an impact will this have on the team's productivity and efficiency? Will there be any drawbacks now that the teams aren't working around the clock in different time zones? Oh, we're definitely still working. Around yeah, the so clock. To, to answer that first question, I, I think, I think we're still going to continue to be that around the sun development, right? Like we shut down and the UK gets going and yeah. so forth and so on. That's definitely not changing. Um, but it, I think the idea of bringing us all close together and reorganizing, I think is a great idea, right? 
Uh, how do you guys feel about it? What do you kind of take away from that? Yeah, I just passed off a bug last night to uh, UK that I was I got I got this far on it. I uh, couldn't figure out this piece. Uh, if you guys can take it, and they did, and we're done in the morning. And yeah. I, why would we stop doing that? Right, exactly. <laughs> yes. and, I, and I don't think that was the goal of the restructure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not to get, take yeah. away from that. It's actually just keep enhancing it's that. A, it's to concentrate the disciplines. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you can put more people together that are doing the same thing to make them more successful. Yeah. Right, and, and that's, and so it's, it's not a negative thing. It's a very positive thing. And yeah. it's, it's actually helped the employees, which has already began doing so. Yeah. yeah. From the war perspective, it's great because the all four of us are, are based here, Dave, Will, Sherry, and I. So that that's really fantastic. We, we do lunch every day together. So so it's a chance to get out of the office and, you know, because sometimes some of the best work is done when you're not working too, when yeah. you're kind of out and about just kind of like doing other things. So it's nice to kind of bring that together. And then if we do have to, to really jam on something, really get it done, we're all here together to kind of like support each other and kind of like get the stuff done. Yeah. So. That's great. Um, all right, next question. All right, this question is from Doc. Doc asks, can you explain in short what DataForge is and how it is used in the different areas? I'm going to look at Calix for this. Shortest one. version of DataForge yes. is that it's how we integrate our uh, XML into the game. We put new stats. That's what it's for. Uh, it is to create new objects, and uh, because there's so many things in the game, there's so like not just the, the entities that appear in the game, but all the uh, the structural elements of of uh, the game rules uh, and uh, levels, and those have their own like connective tissue and th this is to support all that and it's it's a great many files uh, which without data forage has a lot of opportunity for human error mm. uh, and so that's that's one of the places where bugs come from um, this is how mark gets to, to do his deal uh, but uh, data forage is still being built out so it's currently it's it's used uh, for squadron 42. Primarily, uh, it's it's built to support those things and is being uh, pushed over to working on the live game as well. Uh, and we'll be overtaking our previous tool, Stats Monkey, uh, which just read from an Excel uh, Excel sheet and populated XML data, mm. uh, and has its own pitfalls of. Yeah, it's it's you you take your life in your hands when you when you pull Basically, a stats monkey. You know, kind of, yeah, <laughs> went from massive XMLs that just got kind of unsustainable. They're so large, right? Yep. I mean, we do it, but you know, it's very large scripting files yeah. that we have to tweak, <coughs> and it is a lot of user error possibilities. Um, and then we used um, you know the stat monkey to help start um, using spreadsheets to control all these numerical values in all these XMLs. And then Data Forge is kind of the end solution. That's the true interface mm. and the true machine that drives all of this data. It right. in includes cool. integrations, validations, yeah. all of it. That's cool. So you're checking everything. Yep. That's great. So when people like me I tweak a laser <laughs> or something, <laughs> someone just <laughs> forget my colon. Yeah, you right. guys don't let me touch that stuff. That's, that's right, right. Yeah. 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 Out of my script. Not scripts. yet. <laughs> Not yet. Just, you'll be involved. Um, all right, the next one I found is, this is actually a really great question for the group by Krell, K-R-E-L. He says, how does having the level of open development that Stig st strives for impact you, uh, excuse me, impact how you do your jobs compared to how a more traditional company? How uh, do you, how do you decide what's okay to share and when? That's a great question. How, just let's answer the first question. How does this open level impact your jobs? Completely. Yeah? <laughs> Completely. Why? Why do you say uh, It's, well, particularly the things that I do uh, very directly impact the final experience. Like, yeah. like the, the balance things, flight behaviors. Like, uh, if I make a change, someone has noticed it. Mm. Uh, like, we have, yeah, it's, so being able to hear back from backers is exciting and terrifying, and, and uh, it's it's incredible, and I, I don't want to like underplay that. Uh, but it also there's there's an element of I definitely have the the backers in mind. Like I have I have all all one million voices in my head uh, when I make a change, and I'm like, <laughs> how's that gonna play? Yeah, which is you know which is good. Uh, I. I definitely and stay I, I, accountable. Yeah, well, and I, I think to say that, I'm not sure if everybody knows that we're talking to, Calix does a lot of, implements a lot of the balance, right? It yeah. obviously is a company-wide discussion and a company-wide, yeah. everybody has yeah, their I hands in it. Having people you know, have access so early is, is a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah, 
Totally. And then I love, for me, I love the transparency because, uh, you know, being able to chat to the community in regards to the actual tech that's involved. Yeah. And uh, kind of some of our uh, methods and the uh, kind of the geeky side of the art is pretty fun because, um, like I very much grew up in you know mod communities where everyone shares information, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of information shared to me, which allowed me to be able to do what I do, and to be able to interact with modders on our own forum, and they ask questions on how some of the tech works, and then I could kind of explain how we do things. I think it's kind of cool because it allows me to give back what gave to me, and I know if I was, you know, younger, you know, I mean, I, I would have loved for a company that had this kind of high-end yeah. art to yeah. have access to one of the developers and ask questions and to get answers would have been just the coolest thing ever. So it's also really inspiring. Yeah, yeah. and it's and yeah. it's you know it's really pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, to add to that, the you've been doing a lot of character stuff recently, and right. and Sean just voiced over that great video that we saw at SyncCon. Yeah. I mean, that was tech that you guys had just shut down or gotten to that point right. days before. How did that feel to go? I literally finished that, and here we're showing everybody. Yeah, that was exciting because yeah. definitely, you know, the Gary Oldman, um, and then the characters in the Moral Tour were uh, yeah. using all that new tech, it's cool. um, and it's you know from the heads uh, to the bodies, and there's lots of people involved to help make that happen, and it's pretty remarkable tech, and I'm looking forward to kind of sharing some of that tech with. Uh, with our fans as cool. far as some of our approaches and how we do it and maybe we'll make some videos of kind of some tutorial or kind of some examples of how it works that we can kind of share. Yeah. So when we do get modders, you know, they kind of have a head start. That's great. Nice. I, from the writing side, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's great because yeah. it means more lore, because yeah. it means that every single week we've got something to share with you at least and the mm -hmm. jump points too and it kind of helps us define the world even in even greater detail than you normally would uh, at a game at this point, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. And then we also have the interactive, uh, the messages of being able to, you know, take people's responses on the message boards and, and use them to, to, to kind of like, especially a lot of the role-playing stuff that's been going on recently around yeah. the attack at Vega. We've been able yeah. to, to use some of the great role-playing done there by, by the fans and by everyone to kind of like help uh, fill out certain, certain aspects of that too. So yeah. it is really great and we also, every once in a while we'll do like a lore builder segment where if we want to help build out the history behind, you know, Sadaball or behind, you know, maybe how a certain, you know, part of government is structured, it's great to get the input from the backers because yeah. there's a lot of people out there. It's four of us, you know, we, we, we can only know so much, but the community is so vast and has such a great experience and such a great, you know, depth of knowledge that it's great to be able to have that there to kind of like dip into and see what they're feeling or just kind of be able to tap into that, uh, yeah. that knowledge and expertise. That's great. So it's fantastic. That's yeah, cool. it's really nice. I, and I would say to button it up on the production side, right? Um, I definitely, from where I came previously, or where I've been in, in previous places, it's just, it's very abnormal. It's very abnormal to share everything all the time. I mean, I think my first week at the company, it was my second day on the job. They're like, hey, that meeting you were just in? Okay, now go on camera and tell everybody what you just talked about. It was, the, it was a wild experience, but it was, it was kind of freeing also to know yeah. that I'm getting feedback and I'm working with them and just like I get to work with you guys. It's a, it's a, it's a wild experience, but it, um, I think the benefits are immense because we can afford those benefits here at this place, right? There are definitely restrictions coming from the business side that you can't do certain things, right? But I think that's great that we can we can do that stuff. So yeah, I'm loving it. I think it's great. Like you try to you try to talk about anything that's in the game, obviously. Uh, anything that uh, Chris has talked about is always safe, uh, and I, I tend to sort of gauge the things that I talk about either. Uh, by the level of authority that I personally have over it, mm -hmm. like if I have done this thing mm -hmm. and I know everything about it, then I feel a bit more comfortable talking about that because the things that we want to avoid, we don't want to, we don't want to promise things or make it sound like we're doing things that we're not because that level miscommunication is probably the hardest thing yeah. about this. Is that like if if you lead people to believe something, uh, whether you think it's true or you misspoke or like. If that ever happens, and there's there's a lot of there's, there's a lot to be uh, held accountable for, yeah. and, and so you try to, to be open and honest, uh, but you also like you have to be very careful speaking speculatively ever. Totally, totally. Uh, so like, if something isn't a sure thing, I, I try to like, I'll, I'll 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 try to play with it and be like, okay, we're open to these ideas because that much is true. We're trying. Yeah. To do these things, but uh, until until it's in the game, it's not real. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. like, you know, that's, uh, that's why I sort of leave it to you to tell me when things go out because that's right. it's it went until until that happens, 
Yeah, you know no, it's I mean? absolutely right. And, and I think back to our other question is if we work in the creative industry, you, you know that, I mean, we're coming up with crazy stuff all the time in every meeting, all the time. So if we were to say all that crap all the time out, it would be, we would be all over the place. But obviously, yeah. it's not the, that's just how we flush out these creative ideas. That's how we get to that oh, final product. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah. we, I think that's the when we go to the last part of that question, right? I think that's the point of like when do you decide to share it? It's like when we know, like you said, it's going to be there or right in there. We need your help, yeah. um, you know, because we do want that feedback. But at the same time, we don't want to be like, here's the craziest stuff we've thought of today. <laughs> Sometimes you implement things and they don't work exactly. as well as you could. Then you exactly. Gotta exactly. Exactly. And, and evolve that that idea to make sure yeah. that it works, you know, your next attempts. And that happens everywhere. Anywhere I've yep. ever worked, right, on the writing side. I mean, you don't, the yep. first script you write, you don't go, yep, that's yeah, it, yeah, see you ya. You don't walk right. away from it, yeah. yeah. So if you shared that Never script done. and they're like, wait, why did that guy not say that? You're like, well, yeah. because that was dumb. I shouldn't have written that. Right? <laughs> anyway, all right, uh, next question from Carl Rico asks a nice and easy question. What computer games do you guys play? Arena Commander doesn't count, of course. So we'll start to my left. Forrest, what, what computer games do you play? It doesn't say ever or now or currently, so you kind of take it how I you want. I played Battlefront all weekend. Battlefront? Kidding me? Of course. Okay. Loved it. It's great. Anything else? Just Battlefront. That's your game. Uh, That's your jam right now. Well, I got to play for three days. Nice. Um, what else do I play? Uh, I love, obviously, The Witcher. I'm still playing The Witcher. Um, uh, Those are good. <laughs> I got. I, I got a stack this big at home that I never have time to play, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I got like Metal Gear Solid at home. It's I don't the have time secret to play of the industry, that. right? Is that we work in games, but we have got, no time to play games. I got so many games yeah. I want to play, and I don't get to play. My, my Steam backlog is intense. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've been trying to catch up on uh, some of some of the indie darlings that I've missed out on playing. Uh, just played through Gone Home and Her Story, both of which I really enjoyed. Uh, uh, the Oil Blue, I believe it's called. It was a uh, I was enjoying that one, uh, and Metal Gear Solid Five, which I'm like 26 percent of the way in after like 100 hours. <laughs> I couldn't even beat the demo. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "This is it. This is all I, this is all I need." That's yeah. awesome. Uh, for me, uh, I've been playing Witcher. I got back on the Witcher Three last was it last week, the week before. Uh, Call of Duty. Did I just jump in and shoot some people and jump out? Battlefront. I was playing. Probably the same time Force was playing. But that's all. That's console. Yeah. That's technically not PC. The, yeah. the question was computer games. But a console's a computer, right? Well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say a PC. I mean, it doesn't matter. If that's Fallout's coming over, then everyone's life is yep. going to be over. Yeah. That's how it is. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's yeah. it for me. Yeah, I mean, basically, I've just been focusing on Witcher 3 right now, just trying to, to get through that. and do. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get to everything. I can't but stop <laughs> hunting for treasure. I'm, yeah, I, that's the problem. There's too many question marks. There's none of those. Yeah, if there's no question marks, I would It would be a lot easier. I'm, I'm, I'm to the point where I'm almost done with, like, the main story, and I know that, so I'm kind of clearing up some Witcher contracts and secondary quests. Just play I some indie games. They can probably be, you can beat them. Yeah, you can, I, they have the an end. <laughs> what I do is I balance it with Rocket League then. So if oh, I'm just going yeah. home and I just need to kind of, like, do something and not get sucked into a story for like the next hour, then I just play a bunch of matches of Rocket League and it's fantastic, it's a lot of fun. The Although the real answer is of course Arena Commander. Arena I mean, you Commander. Can, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't tried the buggies yet in Arc Corp. That's something I want to go try to set on fire soon, so. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. I was enjoying that thoroughly. All right, next question uh, from Kyron Akari. No relation to my middle name. Um, <laughs> lightly <laughs> story. Which your name? <laughs> You'll have to guess. Uh, in the live stream for subscribers, Chris mentioned that players potentially can avoid combat entirely. I have tried to play many different games peacefully in the past, but most games almost require combat to advance or progress. The daily work was just becoming a grueling grind, and my IRL job was becoming more fun. How is the team working together to make peaceful occupations exciting, fun, and intriguing? And how big of a priority will this be moving forward? I think the star map does a pretty good job of showing hostile zones, right? As opposed to safe zones. Yeah, that, that'll definitely be a way for, for players to be able to plan routes around that and kind of like limit the amount of uh, kind of like interactions they may have with right. uh, kind of uh, unlawful forces, so to say, or, or hostile forces. So that's, yeah, and, and the size of it too, just uh, being able to see how much size between everything. So hopefully you'll be able to like, all right, if I know that there's something over in this direction, if I want to avoid stuff, I, let me just go the other way. I imagine it's about being conservative, right? Because otherwise, if you want that high risk, high reward type situation, that's where it starts getting more dangerous. But if you're going to be more conservative about it and want a steady flow, um, and then you're going to kind of avoid all that stuff. 
Yeah, there's there's a PvP slider, which will help uh, you hedge your bets on that. But ultimately, you're probably not going to be able to completely avoid combat. Mm -hmm. However, there's all these things in the game, like the contract system, you'll be able to hire NPCs to come escort you places. There's no reason you need to pull the trigger. Like, just run away from those things and let these people, these NPCs, take care of you. Uh, there's also all these support roles that we're really pushing on, on making interactive and, and deep and skill-based and fun. Uh, all the things from like mining and salvage to uh, repair, uh, to do running tactics in a uh, larger ship, um, you know, the engineering, all these things where you might still be in, find yourself in combat, you might still be actively in danger zones, mm -hmm. but the thing you're doing is helping your people, helping your side as opposed to attempting to harm the other side. Uh, as like there's the endeavor for like going for uh, the research and hospital and the, the uh, space farming even like uh, we got like we we are building that out um, basically with each new ship we're looking at new ways to be okay we've got we've got combat what else are you gonna do with this ship are you gonna do cargo or are you gonna do uh, repair I, you know, I'm just yeah. I'm just gonna have our QA team guide me everywhere, the, uh, <laughs> escort me everywhere because they're the best of the game. <laughs> they, they know everything. Or you can do what was super popular back when you know back in the '90s and the early 2000s. Run your own dedicated server because we do support that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Then you have complete privacy, yeah. which is super awesome that people forget about that we allow gamers to do, which is very PC oriented. And I miss those days because you don't get to do that very much with games anymore. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and from a lore perspective too, we're we're very obviously we we we've seen the response of the community that yeah, not everyone wants to like be dogfighting or kind of like shooting all the time, and that uh, the latest lore post was about the response, so the relief response to the attack on Vega, and how there were merchant marines running supplies in people that don't want to fight, but maybe want to go and help out if there's if there's some kind of crisis, if there's a civil war, or a famine somewhere in the verse. We understand that there's not only people that want to go in there and try to be a part of the action, but also maybe maybe try to help the, the community get better there too. So it's already in the back of our mind that we're, we're planning missions that don't necessarily always need to end with you drawing your gun or firing a weapon, that you can, you can resolve things in other ways too. So we're, we're very conscious of that. We're ready to, to make sure that's a part of the experience too for those who want it. I'm always impressed with uh, how resourceful communities are, even in other games where I've seen people running like taxi services in, in other games and like yeah. we explicitly support that like here's a thing that we're gonna we're gonna do and we're gonna be doing you know trying to find as many of those avenues as possible and I, I have no doubt that the community is going to show us new ways to do this yeah yep. yeah for sure next question from Phoenix Branson um, he says <laughs> we have seen many manufactured logos for Star Citizen will SIG also create new logos for fast food restaurants for the PU Go with me on this one, such as pizza joints, taco stands, or ice cream parlors. So, but the question for this group, really, and it kind of goes back to how we work together, you know, how, we're going to have a lot of stuff happening in our game, right? All over the place. We're going to have all kinds of shops and fun things like that. What level does that impact you guys in the way that you do your job? Like, do you, do you, again, this kind of goes back to, and I'm, and I'm coming feeding from the first question, you know, when you see how a shop works, is that more driven by? you to come up with the name or do you like no I'm gonna I think the name should be this or based on the shop you know like kind of how does that stuff come together or and you know how does that usually work? I work mostly with the ships uh, and so the ships obviously integrate with the rest of, rest of the game but as those parts come online we have things like uh, the billboards that go on the whole series yeah or the uh, the whole like merchant bazaar that goes on the merchantman mm. um, and so we have we have those things being built out and integrated into our ships, and there's sort of a back and forth on that of uh, what makes for a good walkable space in your ship, what makes for a, uh, a good thing to just find out in space versus what's been designed to be on, on the terrestrial, like when you go down a planet side. Hmm. Uh, so those, those things definitely uh, intersect. And we back and forth on it's it. It's generally a combination of art and yeah. literature, because they'll put 
shops and the stories sometimes, right? Or just yeah, like yeah, we've, d we've definitely seeded a bunch of uh, yeah. specific locations and, and specific shops, you know, yeah. to that are either universally kind of like around or maybe exactly. just in a specific location. So if you're gonna go to this specific landing zone, we probably already know the name of the shop there, who's yes. running it. So that way, when you guys get to that point of building it out, having to design it, you come to us and we can let you know, yeah. oh, this is gonna be the dark bar where people are gonna come in and like yeah. do info agent stuff. And uh, I know from our perspective too, there's also, um, we already have a working dock just that, that open for all the writers. So if we have an idea for a fun billboard or something that might elicit anything, and it doesn't have to be related directly to a product in the game, it could be for like, you know, learn Xi'an today. So it's like a, you know, instead of learn Spanish or learn French, you know, like we have a working dock. If you just think of one, you go and we, we just drop the idea in there because we have had requests from the PU team in Austin to be like, hey, we just need stuff to be able to populate the backgrounds mm -hmm. and the street corners and stuff like that. So it's one of those, you know, we're maybe not, you know, focusing every single day on it, but if you get one of those ideas over the course of a week, you go in there, you drop it in, and it's just, you just slowly build up that list. So when it comes time for them needing more of them, we've got uh, already a database set you aside that, for that. You've yeah. got that seven hour Xi'an workshop. Where yep. Perfect for the trader on the go. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, we make sure to, you know, all the style guys and everything are kind of yeah. taken the literature and starting to build out these logos. You see it in Art Corp, right? We got some logos and then yeah. I'm sure we'll kind of repeat, you know, we're a very modular environment. Um, yeah. So I don't see any reason that we couldn't have kind of corporate shops, you know, that or, or um, you know, a string of shops that show up in different locations. You yeah, know? Cubby Blast and Casab exactly. Outlet and, and all those, those are meant to be all around the UE. Right. So um, yeah, it, it's perfect for us too because it, it it's familiar for the player and it's also easy for design to go yeah. in and just kind of replicate. Cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. great. I got another really great question here. Uh, I think this will be really interesting for us all to talk about by CC Corp said, I would love to get what the thought process is that goes throughout each stage in rebuilding or redesigning the older ships. For example, the Hornet or the 300 series. Does a lot of talk happen between each department or is it just tossed back and forth until it's perfect and not something really completely different from the original? Because you know, what I love about this question is it's happening. We kind of talked about with the pipeline a little bit, but we didn't really touch on older ships, right? We didn't talk about, we talked a little about the Constellation, but how, you know, do you go, this ship isn't what we had originally planned, hey guys, let's talk about it. Or is it just tech is, you know, the new thing, like, what's that normally happen? You, usually the first thing that we do is we look at one of the legacy ships, and there's some obvious fixes that we need to do, right? Uh, make it more modular, mm. right? Standardize the parts that are inside the ship. That way we have, like, an external library that we could pull from. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a seat and a joystick, instead of building it unique to one ship, right, we keep that kind of separate, and that's a thing now, right, that we can potentially put in other ships. Yeah. Uh, we also learned very early that we had to standardize all of our um, interface as you're sitting in the cockpit um, and create templates and to create uh, kind of proxy examples of how animation works because we can't have an unlimited amount of animation. So it has to be fairly reusable from ship to ship. Yeah. And then we kind of started targeting in on uh, individual manufacturers. So um, each manufacturer has kind of a specific layout that's kind of consistent with other ships. Mm. Um, the other thing is, you know, we obviously have switched a lot of our tech. We went from, you know, doing the kind of traditional unwraps and um, doing textures from scratch to moving over to a more tiling system. And then uh, obviously when physical-based rendering came on, we had to start converting all the ships over to the new rendering system, which required us to update all of our textures and all of our materials. Um, so that's still kind of a big challenge and we're still um, <coughs> porting over ships from that system. And then we have stuff like the cargo system that's kind of finally starting getting standardized, which meant we had to update all of our um, cargo holes to actually support the new designs, um, which, you know, the Constellation is the best example of, of taking a legacy ship and now bringing it into our kind of next-gen pipeline. Mm. You know, everything from the seats to the interface to the cargo system to the materials to our modeling techniques to the reusability to the modular aspects and then the gameplay requirements. Um, so that was kind of a big, a big chunk that was required and we decided to tackle that and it took some time. But um, now that we have all these systems in place, it ended up being a very good um, example of what we needed to do for some of our smaller ships. So is it, is it always generally systems or have you guys ever gotten involved later to reimagine a ship? Uh, I think uh, while I've been here, the, the biggest thing has been more about uh, the components used in the ship, mm -hmm. is that there was a really long list of components, different manufacturers that have been created in lore, yeah. that we realized there were a lot of double triples that maybe just for simplicity's sake at this point, if we kind of like tried to pare those down so it was just easier for the designers, for the artists, like, oh, it's going to be this one manufacturer that produces this one thing. We don't need 40 different companies making shield generators. You know, we can 
have the, the standard few, which will have their obvious, obviously pros and cons. Mm. Um, so that 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 that's been a big thing. And some, sometimes there are ships that we've had ideas for in lore that that uh, that we, we want to be able to work on, but maybe some of the stuff you guys are doing kind of affects that. So we're like, oh, we're gonna have to make sure and go back that that this one is feels distinct enough, and it's not just a, a copy of this to a certain degree. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and uh, from the scheduling side, from the production side, it's we're always looking at what's next, what makes sense, because we have a limited amount of resources, right? We're all, we're all a resource at this company, and so it's always like, well, we'd love to get back and redo some of these older ships, but we just don't have the bandwidth, because we really want to get onto the new ships. So it's always a kind of, a kind of a balancing act. Um, some th that we just become passionate about, because we've been really looking at it for three years, and some that we're like, oh, well, we'll get back to it. Let's, yeah. It's really more important to get onto these items. It's yeah. also, as features come online, yes, like, exactly. there's more mm -hmm. things to refactor. So we could yeah. go back and we could make the Aurora and the 300 series up to, up to our current systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but the time that it will take to do that, we will have another system up yeah, and exactly. so we'll just need to do it again. Yeah. Uh, so to a certain extent, we have to look at how out of date things are versus how much we'd be able to bring them up to speed uh, and how much we're still building the game to be. Yeah. So yeah. we want to minimize how much we, you know, we don't want to rebuild the ship from complete scratch. Exactly. You know, there's some situations that we kind of have to, but for the most part, for me, really, the most important thing is really uh, the efficiency yeah. and the optimization of it. And a lot of the reasons we've had to go back to the older ships, and we still we need to go back to some of our older ships like the Cutlass, is because when we originally built it, we built them like a traditional game model. Yeah. And now that we have all this tech that you know takes advantage of you know certain approaches. Uh, we need to go back and you know abide by those approaches to make it efficient for the game because yeah. obviously having these extremely expensive ships in the game, you know, kind of hurt uh, performance. And you know, after you know, we kind of initially started getting stuff out there, we're like, you know, we really got to make this game want run well because people are going to be playing today, and they aren't going to be playing when the game would theoretically come out, you yeah. know, years down the road, totally. or a year down the road, or whatever. So yeah. you actually, you know, um, we had to decide, you know, a year or two years ago that, all right. We need to figure out the most efficient way to make these ships, right? Because this is going to be important because this thing needs to sustain for a long period of time. Um, and also, you know, I'm not real big into completely redesigning the old ships. I think it's kind of cool. It's kind of like a classic car. Yeah. You know, I'd rather mm -hmm. see a new model of the ship. You know, get it efficient, get it using all the systems, work with design, and not do too much to it, right? And then create a new version of the ship, right? That's like a new model, like a car. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you, when you see somebody flying around that, you know, 2014 model, you know, yeah, it's yeah, kind of special. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 you, could, you could even break this down from a production standpoint to like we just have like a, a, a rebuilding team, right? And then we have the, the team that's building the ships that we all want to see that we've been talking about. And then we have the live team. Like we have several different kinds of games happening all at the same place with the same resources. And I think that always comes down to pros and cons. What do we want to see before other things and so forth and so on. So, all right, last question. Um, this is a good one. This is from Doc. I don't know if I already asked, asked one from Doc, but we'll go with Doc's because I think this is a good question. Uh, Doc asks, how do you decide priority of the different departments regarding new game mechanics, ideas, and concepts? Is there a weekly boxing fight between department leaders to decide this, but we backers are missing out on it? Just kidding. Smiley face. For new backers, <laughs> for new backers, it would probably be interesting when you describe generally how the usual process goes from concept to release and how the different departments are involved. So Alec can answer the first question, priorities. This is a very, very difficult question. Generally, the, the leads of each of the teams um, are aware of what they need their team to do. Um, we, meet that, we meet frequently, we do weekly goals reviews, we have a master schedule that we're trying to drive the, the long term of this thing. So we're trying to get all the ideas out of Chris's head, we're trying to put it all in one place, right? Put it all together, very much on the production side. That hopefully doesn't burden you guys at all, you guys just keep making awesome stuff. Um, but then we do have constant priority clashing. Force and I have been experiencing this a lot lately because it's the same resources doing multiple different things. Right. So because we know we need to all get it done. You right? got and it. And then that's when you know if, uh, if you have two leads that want to both get something done, right? And yeah. that kind of clashes. That's when you raise it up to production, and yep. that's why like Eric's here for to help make yep. the decision on what does come first. Um, and it's not a boxing match; it's actually a steel cage match. It's still steel cage. That's right. <laughs> I was going to say it was it yeah. on the top yeah. of the ladder. And you put tacks all yeah. over the ground. I, I think a, I think a perfect example, right? Let's use something very realistic to now that Forrest and I just talked about. Uh, the amazingly wildly talented Mark McCall upstairs, right? Right. He is do sh technical ships yeah. and technical animation for he's, characters. He's excellent at everything he does, and so that means everybody wants him and wants to mm -hmm. use him for things. So it, that's a frequent conversation between Forrest and I and the design leads, and like who's going to use Mark for what this week, and what's the long term 
long-term thing. So we're constantly ba battling the, we got the long-term vision, but we got the short-term things we need to achieve, right? So when events come up and we, it's already tech that we've de been developing, we're just about to show it off so we can keep going, it, we're, we're shifting things around frequently. And, it, and, and we're all tense and so we're all trying to get things done and everybody wants to use the same person. And so they're ag aggressive conversations, but it's generally healthy. It's usually for getting the thing done. We all want to get this thing done and make it awesome, make it look great. And we're all trying to drive for our piece and that's usually how it works. But then at the, the end of the day, the leads or people that are leader places, points of contact, they do need to work together and go, okay, all right, I'll give them up for you for this week, but just know that'll mean this and this and this for the schedule. And so that kind of comes down to, like you said, work with production and looking at the long term with all of our studios globally. Right. So it's a, it's a complex little beast. the director's role. Yes. You know, and that's yeah. kind of, you know, yes. if, it, if the leads have a clash on um, what the priorities are, because they both want their own individual disciplines yeah. to have priorities, and then it gets raised up to the directors who can yep. kind of work things out. And, right. and then ultimately Chris, right? We, go, we present that to Chris and say, hey, the directors agree with this, the production agrees with this, this is what the team wants to do. Chris, which way should we go, right? This is, I think anything does a great job kind of seeing this whole somehow, seeing this massive thing <laughs> and going, yeah, let's put this there, there, and there. It's a big yeah. puzzle, right? So, Yeah, Star Citizen is an experience, and it's a, it's a very unique one, and it is driven by the things that you can do mm. and the places you can do it. Yeah. And so that, that means that you have art and you have design and you have programming and all these things really need to add up yeah. to the Star Citizen experience that we're that he, Chris's vision is for. Yep. So it on a, on a given thing that balance might skew differently because uh, also at a given time because you know sometimes it's really easy to get something functional but ugly. Yeah. Sometimes it's very easy to get something pretty but not functional. Yeah. And then we fill in the rest, mm -hmm. right? So it's and it's, it comes back to we were talking earlier about that context of get as much of the thing in so that that informs your decisions, that informs the thing that you're creating. Yeah. And when, it, when the thing exists, you can say, yes, that is right, or no, that needs to be a little bit different and for these reasons, and that, that continues to build upon itself into, into a real thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, really, it's really important. Totally. And I think on that beautiful note, I think that's a great way to end. So again, uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed this very uh, interesting and unique 10 for I think we had a great time. Um, again, thank you to the subscribers for allowing us to do this additional content. We love getting this stuff out in front of you guys as soon as early as possible, as discussed in question four, I think it was. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but again, thanks. Come back. We've got more for you. Uh, I want to thank Adam and Calix and Forrest, and um, hopefully we'll do this again very Aaron soon. For reading thank all you. Hey, for being part of the question. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, See you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching um, 10 for the Chairman. Uh, if you guys would like to uh, see more episodes, go here. If you guys would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel and always keep up to date with all our video content, go here. And uh, if you guys would like to watch episodes of Around the Verse, go here, please. And I will see you in the verse. This video made possible by the ICC Stellar Surveyors and subscribers like you.